Alright, so we continue in, in Romans chapter 1. <laughs> First number 4 today, we're still looking at Jesus. Last week we looked at some of who he was and who he was in the flesh. And verse 4 speaks more about who he is in the spirit, or his divinity, if you will. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 4. It says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Mm-hmm. Here, it said Jesus is still the subject. Last week, he pointed out how he was Son of God, how he was Jesus, Christ, and Lord, seated mm-hmm. David according to the flesh. But now he tells how he is the Son of God according to the Spirit. Here it says he's declared to be the Son of God. He wasn't created to be the Son of God. He wasn't born to be the Son of God, but as he says he was declared, he was proclaimed, he was determined that he is the Son of God. Amen. This really occurred in eternity past, before the incarnation. When God determined all things, when he declared all things. Mm-hmm. But we see it manifest in time when he came in the flesh and he was declared the Son of God by the things that he did. As it says here, with power. By the, the power that he worked in and the things that he did to show that he was the Son of God. Yeah. This power means the ability or strength and it's even right. for miracle working. It's even translated as miracles in a few places. But these these things proclaim that he was the Son of God, that he really was who he said he was. Amen. We turn over to Acts chapter 2. Here just after, well, it is still the day of Pentecost, I believe, but right after the church was in power, the Holy Spirit, and everyone heard in their own tongue. Then they, the Jews accused the apostles of being drunken. Mm-hmm. Peter gets up to preach in verse 22. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. This, he says these miracles and wonders and signs show us that he was approved of God. Amen. No, but it's greater than we believe by faith, but to confirm who he was or to show who he was, he did all these <coughs> miracles and wonders and signs. He said, Amen. The, the Jews, they certainly weren't going to believe if he just said, Yes, I'm the Son of God. Right. That he, <coughs> in power, displayed who he really was. But even then, they, most of them doubted still. Amen. Most of the them said that he had a devil. Right. Yet, Christ said, Does, can Satan cast out himself? Mm-hmm. Well, certainly Satan has power, but the Son of God, Christ, he has much greater power. Even, Amen. Even over Satan himself. We see these, this power that he had, it just confirmed that he really was the Son of God. That he wasn't just another prophet that came along. Some of the people regarded him as such. They've had. Is that's what the Muslims teach that he was just right. a prophet. But no, he was much more than just a prophet. The woman at the well, she said at first she said, uh, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. She would find out later he was much more than just a prophet. He was the Christ, the Messiah, which they were looking for. Amen. But said so these miracles were just an, an approval of God, if you will, that He was the Christ. If we turn over to John chapter five. Christ testifies this Himself.
John chapter 5, verse 36 and 37. I'm going to read verse 35 as well. I'm oh, sorry, chapter 6, sorry. Verse 36 of chapter 5 says, But I have greater witness than that of John. He was talking of John the Baptist, how he bear witness to the truth. And he said, I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given to me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness to me that the Father has sent me. Amen. The Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. So he says that these works that he did, that bore witness of them, and God himself bore witness of them, which we know that God literally spoke when he was baptized, said, this is my beloved son, whom I will please hear ye him. Mm -hmm. right. Then these, these powers, these works, these miracles, these wonders and signs, as they're called, they, they just confirm that he was of God, that he was That's right, truly the son of God. Going on back in our our text here, we'll see in a moment that it was primarily the power of resurrection that confirmed who he was. Right. These other things certainly testified to them, but ultimately the resurrection confirmed it without a doubt. Amen. But he, back in Romans 1 4, he says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit. Of holiness. Mm -hmm. Some think this is referring to the Holy Spirit, and others to the Spirit of Christ, His, his divine nature that was within Him. Certainly, both can be described as, by holiness. The Holy Spirit certainly is holy, and Christ Himself was holy, both in the flesh and in His divinity. Mm -hmm. This is who He was according to the Spirit. In the flesh, He was. Jewish, if you will, the Hebrew of, of the seed of David, mm -hmm. well, of Mary, the household of David, I mean, of well, David and of Joseph, but he was divinely of God. Amen. The Son of God said, We know he was not created or conceived and come into being in the womb of Mary, but in the flesh, in a sense, he was. But right. He'd always been the Son of God. He'd always been God the Son. And he always will continue to be. But according to the Spirit and his spiritual nature, if you will, he was the Son of God with power. Amen. But this is opposed to him being just a weak, humble servant in the flesh. Mm -hmm. In his divine nature, he was the Almighty, powerful, Amen. God of the universe. As he proclaimed himself to be that when we see him over in Revelation. But he came meek and lowly, didn't he? Right. Flesh. So we see both his human nature and his God nature, if you will, throughout his ministry. But throughout the Word of God, it's displayed in different ways. But he was both fully man and fully God. Amen. Yet without sin. But going on here, he goes on to say that he has his power, or he was declared by his power by the resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. This is in three different ways that he had the, that he was confirmed by the resurrection of the dead. This first, it was manifest that. He had this power that he was who he says he was by raising the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to turn to these instances, but Luke 7, verses 11 through 15, tell the widow woman's son of Nain mm -hmm. how they were heading to the cemetery and she, he raised them up. Luke chapter 8, verse 41 through 56, we see this account of Jairus' daughter who was sick and then dead. And what Christ went to him and said, she's just sleeping, and they laughed in the scorn. Right. And he <clears throat> said, made a rise, and she arose. And of course, we all know the story of Lazarus in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. It 
tell the whole account there how that he was dead three days and yet God raised him still. Amen. A Christ raised him. But yet, even that way, many people doubted still who he really was. Amen. You know, only those that have been of God had ever raised anyone from the dead. In fact, Elijah and Elisha are the only ones I know of before Christ. And certainly they were the men of God doing the will of God. Mm -hmm. But secondly, we see that his power and being is displayed at his death when the bodies of the saints arise. We can turn over there real quick to Matthew 27. If you recall when he gave up the ghost and he had cried out, he just finished. The veil of the temple was rent twain from top to bottom. There was a great earthquake. Matthew 27, verses 50 through 54. It says, Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from, top, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. If the earthquake was powerful enough that it broke the rocks in two. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a little sh tremor. It was a pretty massive earthquake. Verse 52 goes on saying, The graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Amen. <laughs> These things testify who, that he, to who he was. He was truly the Son of God. That's it. And even just at his death, the graves were opened. That the dead... I don't know if it was all the Old Testament saints or just some of them. There's debate about that, but that these saints arose and appeared unto many just once again shows his power and his being. Right. And then what's most importantly is his own resurrection from the dead demonstrates most surely that who he was and his power. Amen. And turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm sure these are familiar verses, but they tell the importance of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll begin verse 11. In the first part of the chapter, Paul gives us the gospel in summary of the Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. By his death, our sins were paid for, but by his resurrection, we have life and life eternal. Amen. First Corinthians 15, verses 11 through 20. Say, therefore, whether... Excuse me. Yeah, well, I'm going to go to verse 12. Now if we preach... Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how will say some among you that there is no resurrection? of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. They, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now as Christ risen from the dead becomes the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. He goes on to say how we will in the same like manner be raised one day. But with Christ did not raise, be raised says so we are all men most miserable. We, <laughs> without hope, our faith is in vain. It even goes on to say in verse 17, you are yet in your sins. Because unlike the, the Old Testament sacrifices, they could just roll sin over for a year. Mm -hmm. Christ had to completely destroy 
sin. Amen. And death as well. <coughs> Without the resurrection, he did not defeat death. Mm -hmm. But he could not be holding of it, one scripture says. No, well, he says that we'd be most miserable if we would only hope in this life. The resurrection gives us hope of eternal life. Unlike Muhammad and Buddha and all these other false prophets in the world, Christ is the only one to ever be resurrected from the dead. Amen. To live eternally. And in that we can have hope. There's no hope in a dead Savior. This resurrection truly testifies to who he is and who he was. Mm -hmm. That he was more than just a prophet. None of the other prophets had ever been raised from the dead. He was more than just a con artist, as some people think he is. And yet, just as Christ was raised, we shall one day be raised by that same power. Amen. First Corinthians six fourteen tells us that. No, oh, verse twenty three says every man. In his own order, Christ the first fruit, that was they there, they that are Christ at his coming. Amen. We might be dead physically at that time, but so in Christ we shall be made alive. In Christ, we will be literally resurrected again if we're asleep in the grave. The Christ is the first fruits. He is the first one to ever be raised. In from the dead to live free, to live eternally, excuse me. Amen. But we shall be in the same fashion at his coming. Well, I don't know exactly what happened to Lazarus or the widow woman's son or Jairus' daughter, but I know they must have all died again at some point. Right. But the resurrection we speak of here is an eternal one. It's a resurrection and a perfection, as they'll go on to say later on in this chapter, when this corruptible will put on incorruptible, this mortal will put on immortality. And that is the resurrection that truly testifies that Christ was the Son of God. Amen. That he really was who he said he was. He really came to do what he said he was going to do. And not only would he die for sin, but he would defeat death, hell, and the grave. Really all in the same act, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yet without this resurrection, he says we're doing all this in vain, aren't we? Right. Because our preaching is in vain, our faith is in vain. And which have went to sleep in Christ, they are perished. There's so much more than hope in this life. Mm -hmm. But it can only be possible with the resurrection of Christ. We cannot, we should not minimize that. I said his death is important. We would, for 13 weeks, a couple years ago, at just how he fulfilled the sacrifice in his death. Mm -hmm. But all that was, would have been in vain if he had not rose from the dead. Right. So, all this just points to who he truly was, that he wasn't just some man, that he wasn't just some good man, he wasn't just some prophet or some man with good advice, as many people see him today. Mm -hmm. But he truly is and was the Son of God. Amen. And by his resurrection, we have great hope. Mm -hmm. Hope that the world doesn't understand. Hope that other religions can't offer their followers. So how we receive so much more through, and we'll look a little bit at that next week. We're going to close with that. Let's just not be forgetful. Amen. How important the resurrection is. Amen.